Uh, we haven't lost anybody yet. So, all right. Well, thank you guys all for making it out today. Today is a it's a catch all because when you start talking about you know basically market animals, sheep, goats, cattle, all that, all that comes with pasture as well. And you're saying, hey, you've got an hour to talk about and cover every one of those aspects. Uh, it becomes pretty difficult. And not everybody's obviously uh, interested in those aspects of it. So uh, we are here today. This is Mr. Willis Gillum's farm. Uh, Mr. Gillum's been here for quite a long time, uh, many years. His, uh, his son actually lives right across the road and uh, works for Farm Credit. Um, and so that's something we can talk about on down the road a little bit. Uh, traditionally, he's been in the sheep and goat business. They've got a few cattle that they've been running over here. Uh, and that kind of changes as we go. But traditionally, Mr. Gilm has been involved in the sheep and goat business. And so uh, he sometimes flips, he'll have all goats and then he'll have all sheep. And so it just kind of goes back and forth. So he, uh, when he retired from AT&T Bell South, he started working uh, just part-time for fun at the Manchester uh, Stockyard. And so he's really in tune with the, the sheep and goat business. And so hopefully he'll be a good resource for those that have a little bit more interest in the, the sheep and goat business. Uh, we'll also be using this site for some of our master small ruminant classes uh, along the way. But for tonight, what we start talking about is if, if I'm going to break it down into kind of three options, I kind of interesting who thinks that they'd be most interested. I'm going to give you the option of kind of the sheep and goats, cattle wise. Uh, and we're going to be probably a little bit lighter on that because we've covered it in a lot of different areas. And then pastures. Who would be most interested? I'd be interested to find out who is most interested in the pasture side of it. Okay. Who's most interested in probably the sheep and goat side of it? Okay. And then uh, the cattle side, we've got, okay, we've got a few that they're off, obviously. Okay. So. We're trying to figure out how to maximize one hour. So I think what we're going to try to do, because no matter the basis between any operation, whether you've got horses, sheep and goats, um, cattle, the basis of everything is pastures. So I think we're going to try to just walk this. I always feel it's best to answer your question. So this is a good format to not have me just spit out a bunch of stuff that may or may not be relevant, but to walk through the pasture and start just kind of discussing and answering some of your questions. So for the first part of that, we'd like to just kind of do that. That hopefully hits on a lot of different areas for each one of you. Then Mr. Gillum is, we might break off. We can discuss pastures in a little bit more in depth if we want. We can talk about some of the cattle over here. Um, and when I say cattle, they're, the, they're some of the novelty types. So they, also, they do some um, feeder steers that they've sold all those right now. And so the rest are Scottish Highlanders, which oh. is the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the alpaca novelty that there is right now. So I've got a lot of people that are interested actually in some Scottish Highlanders, but, uh, but they, they, they function the same as regular cattle. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that and just cattle in general. And then the other half can, can uh, discuss or ask questions with Mr. Gillum. He's got a, uh, a flock of sheep out here hair sheep so they kind of from a distance they look a lot more like goats but he's got some hair sheep out here uh he does have some goats over here a little bit more on the show side but he he's uh well versed in each one so we might break apart there and let you guys get a little bit more uh, questions related to that so um are there any questions as we go so i think it's best as we kind of just start this walk we're going to kind of walk through here we'll walk through the the uh the sheep pasture, we can kind of see, you can see this, these pastures have been pretty well grazed down. Uh, they've had a pretty intense amount of uh, sheep on here over the past winter. And so we'll look at that. We'll look at some reseeding that we, we worked on this past fall. And so what, where it's kind of looking at now with some um, cattle and then we're getting ready to put some cattle on this other as well. So We'll start walking through here, answering any of your questions. So any questions right off the bat that, just, that I can help answer right this minute. I have a question about the Highland cattle. Are, are they actually, because they're more ornamental, I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> are they actually like legit ag business? Can you repeat it? What, Highland? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. 
So I just I just bought one the other day in Alabama, and he has a meat he has a meat processor. Yes, it's so, lean meat. They're they're twenty one percent fat versus I think it's twenty four. So the the question being was. Um, <laughs> Then I'll holler, we'll keep this up. Yeah. The, the question is, is, are Scottish Highlanders a viable ag product? Yes, they are. They, you know, if you're looking at sheer pounds, you're obviously, you're not going to get the sheer pounds in the market. You're going after more of a specialty market, uh, whether you got a lot of people right now breeding them just because yeah. there's very popular. I I'm, I'm think right now I've got four customers looking for Scottish Highlander cattle. Um, they are a... You, obviously a much smaller animal yeah. so for those that have a much smaller piece of property you can manage them a little bit different but um no when you start cutting them open you're going to get a still beef quality steak you know it just depends on what your your idea of what steak is. Is there, so there's different types of islands so there's different types of islands? no that's usually that's the, the name oh, that they go off there so Anybody that has any difficulty walking a great distance, I've got two rangers here. They're welcome to use them. Okay. So uh, if anybody does need help, we're gonna um, we can utilize those. But if not, we're just gonna kind of walk up. We're gonna walk across the ridge line and just kind of look at that, and then we'll walk through this pasture. And I'll try to point out things that I'm seeing. Um, and yeah. then you guys feel free to answer questions or ask questions as we oh, go along here. As we walk through here, you can kind of see that this thing is pretty heavily grazed down. There's a popular weed out here. There's obviously there's some chickweed and things like here that you'll see. But what you don't see out here. And maybe this area is one of the really popular weeds that's starting to come along. I, I noticed maybe a little bit more up to where you get a very high traffic area and you get washing areas, especially uh, if you've got really heavy, heavy overgrazing and compaction is buttercup. And so probably, especially if you've got horses, that's where you're really going to see buttercups. We don't see it as much. Uh, on the cattle side, unless you've got an area that's got really high compaction and um, erosion. So for the most part, what you're going to see out here, you, you'll see that they graze about every bit of green grass all the way down to the ground. Um, during the springtime, if I if you saw, this, saw this situation, you have plenty of time for that grass to be recovering. Hopefully you've got ideal conditions. It's still cool. It's still wet. And so that's this grass has a really good opportunity to recover, but it's going to be very, very slow. So if you look at the size of this grass, this is much below three inches that we would recommend doing. So when that grass starts to, when we get, start, get some sunlight to really start to come on, it's going to be far behind this grass that you see kind of over in this, this pasture you'll see probably three to six inches of growth before you on that side, before you get two to three inches of growth over here, because it's, try, it's trying to recover so much from the sunlight. It lacks a lot of the relief to catch all the sunlight. So it's gonna be way behind the two inches of growth here. You'll see six inches over there. 
So that's why you really would like to have this grass start much closer to three inches because it's going to then really come on a lot faster. So when you're starting to manage it, um, you want to be able to try to give as much opportunity for that grass to really come on. So um, he's, in, in this situation, he's been moving them strategically across from the front all the way to the back. Um, but for the situation, he said, I could be honest with you. So I'm the way, there he is. So, <laughs> so and he, he knew, obviously, he said that they're way over grain. And so that's kind of the situation. This is going to start out much, much slower. Um, so if you're a situation like this, if you put some fertilizer on there, you're, it will be a, it will be so slow of going to really get full value versus if you had two or three, if you had three inches at least uh, of grass when you put that fertilizer, you get a, you get exponential growth compared to this because there's only so much time that you have with fertilizer. But you are going to strengthen its its roots, but you're not going to see all the growth in the grazing that comes from it. So, what the, kind of grass in this here? This is you've got for the most part it's fescue. Um, so the, the the green grass you've probably got some Kentucky bluegrass, some kind of what we call poa that's that's sitting mm -hmm. in here. Um, some of these clumps where you've got a little bit wider. Um, also graze down a little bit wider blade that would get in the fescue. And then obviously the stuff you see out here that's brown is the remnants of looks like the little part Bermuda that's out here, but you'll get a lot of summer grasses that'll start to come on. So right now you, you can see that there's a lot of clover, there's chickweed and everything else. So that tells me is that this pasture is mainly filled up with a lot of summer grasses and solar weeds because that's what's filling the gap in right now. Clover and chickweed are filling the gap because normally it would be barren until the summer when a lot of that stuff would start to come on. So uh, any questions about what we've seen here? Yeah, I got a question there. So I know clover can be a, a decent uh, forage. How about chickweed? No, there's, sure. there's not. Uh, the problem with trying to you know say, well, you know, this weed is good, this weed is bad, is they both grow in the same environment. And so typically when we, we talk about this in the soil class, is they're, they're growing where the pH is below 6.0. And so in the front, you probably notice, it's definitely the side, in the front, there's a lot of sage grass, kind of that, that brown grass. That's indicating to us, it doesn't have to be, but it's a good indicator that that pH is dropping down below 6.0. And a lot of times when you get a lot of weed pressure, that can sometimes indicate that our um, pH is dropping down to six or below six. Weeds just grow really well when it's below six and grass tends to grow really well when it's above six. So yes, yet maybe you get chickweed, but clover, which is also kind of a weed and, and depending on what you're talking about um, and beneficial. So you don't want to, it's hard to encourage one and not encourage the other. But uh, clover is a great product um, to plant. A lot of this is, is uh, stuff that's just going to come on and, and naturally grow. And so there's a lot of value, especially right now, there's a lot of value to planting clover, not at this point, but in the right stages. So maybe next winter, planting clover to come in there because you're talking about anywhere per, per season, 30 pounds of nitrogen. You look at anybody price fertilizer and recently, you look at a, you know, per pound of, of nitrogen gain, uh, it's, it's astronomical. So we're talking about clover providing you know, roughly 30 to maybe 40 pounds of nitrogen in a season, uh, spring and maybe a little bit less in the fall. That's a lot of, that's, that's money in your pocket. Uh, and, and cattle do pretty well on it. So. Any questions about what we're seeing right here? Anybody want to know why I live next to a store to a subdivision with hundred with million dollar houses in it? Look for me across that field right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll meet him around here. <laughs> right, yes. I was gonna ask. So this pasture that we're looking Yes. Okay, and it's been raised upon by the sheep, goats, and cattle? The, not the cattle, sheep and goats. Sheep and goats. Both at the same time or one and then 
Well, th this has mainly been sheep. Um, so uh, the last time goats were here, what, two years ago? Three? Well, huh? last time goats were here, about two years ago, three? Two? Two, two, two years ago. ago. What you're seeing, those goats out there will eventually come here. But now I don't separate sheep and goats. They run, they run together. Uh, a lot of people tell you you can't do that. I've done it all my life. But do you find that you have a lot of problems? I ain't got one here today. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Would what you, you find that there's a higher incidence of the pests being transferred from goats to sheep? Are you? Have you found a lot of differences in pests being transferred between goats and sheep? No. no. Yeah, it's. Um, yeah, no, I, mean, coming, it's a, I think they're coming back for something. We were we'll talking about the combination. Well, the, the small ruminants. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well. But, um, what do you do? We'll, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll break apart and get into that a, um, a little bit later. But no, um, what you would see is typically on, on cattle because they lack the having two sets of teeth, they, they won't graze near as low as we get on the, the goats and sheep. And so you know, they're kind of using the tongue to rip it around and pull it. So once they can't get that tongue around the blade, so that's that's where we don't always see the overgrazing. And sometimes we don't see the compaction in the, the weeds that we would typically see in overgrazing situations or, um, or just overgrazing and compaction. We don't see that on the cattle side. We'll see a different set of weeds over here. So we'll walk over here and then we'll walk um, a little bit up the hill to kind of see where we've had some stockpiled and kind of left over. So anybody have a pasture that looks like this? Absolutely. <laughs> Nobody else, but well, we're good. All right. You guys are golden. So I'll put the nitrogen down. <laughs> so, you know, the reason I graze like this is I breed all mine a kid or lamb within a 30 day window. So I can walk right out here to this gate and look right out through here. And I know what's missing and what's not. And they'll they kid, they kid and lamb in three places. On that hillside, on that hillside, and right down there on the hillside. So I can see everything. And that's why this trays like this. So the question will be is if I own this, I always kind of like walk through there. If I own this property today and you ask me if would I put my money on fertilizer for this situation, I would say I would not to get the return on get the return of that money. Uh, in this situation, I would I wouldn't do it. Uh, How long would you keep the animals off of this to let it grow? How long would it take? It's gotta be it's gonna be slow. It's slow. gonna be very slow. So Part, you know, the same thing goes to in the middle of summer. How often do you rotate? It's all weather dependent. Right now, we're getting down in the 30s at night. So it grows not necessarily at all by the sunlight you feel from the day. It's the soil temperature. And so if it's got to have really warm soil temperature, that's what triggers growth. That's what triggers our fescue. That's why it's a little bit slower starting in the spring is because it needs a little bit of ground. The next step. It looks like I think in the next oh yeah the next week or so yeah. it doesn't drop down as much. That's where we're going to start to see really the green up. And so once we start to get um, two or three inches on this grass, that's when it's exponentially going to start popping up and growing. So I want to I want to get probably here five six inches before I would try to get something back out here. Now it's recovering pretty quickly, um, and not all of us have the ability to be able to set pasture aside to get it going but and then you take them off when it goes back down, down to about three feet. inches and so during the summer it may be six weeks to eight weeks if you in an ideal situation let's just go by ideal it may be six to eight weeks before it recovers mm -hmm. enough to get that six to eight inches of growth or say eight inches uh, so during springtime you know you, everybody's been mowing or everybody mows so they find out it grows three inches three or four days sometimes so it just depends on the weather so all right we can walk over here we'll just kind of walk along here and look at it
see a lot of these situations here. It's time out. There's some buttercup coming along. This is obviously where you get a lot of or a track. I got to watch my step. Action. And so that's where we start to see the buttercup. That's This is an ideal time to spray that. So, the compaction yeah. and cracking in the so soil. And that's when you start to see that buttercup. These are a large component of our world. So we try to find ways that work for not only for what we're trying to do for our operation, uh, but also that are aware and conservative of the of the bee population. And so if you look at what happens in the springtime, uh, bees forage two miles away. So if this is my farm and I want to make sure that I'm doing whatever is best for the bee population, they're not just living here. They're living two miles away and further. So I, I can't control what my neighbors do. I like them to be aware. And there are sites out there that talk about um, where certain bee, pop, bee hives are at. And I can't remember it. Taylor, we'll have to look at it, what the name of the site is, but I think it's managed through the, the state of Tennessee, but you can put your bee, beehive on there and so you can see where other ones are at, um, but it's hard to control. Um, but something to be aware of as we're talking about and trying to manage weeds in our pastures, um, we're also being conscious of the bee population is that when during the springtime, bees are foraging primarily on what you see over here, the forage bloom. So you're seeing a lot of tree blooms. And so for the bee population, that's their primary source of forage right now. So the, the, the flowers that we're seeing, which we're not seeing a lot here, um, a lot of people, we, we kind of worry about that. Well, for the most part, that's not where they're getting their forage and definitely not from buttercups. 100% uh, not from buttercups. The bees don't like buttercups. Animals don't like buttercups. Nothing likes buttercups except photographers. So, so you, you're not you're not taking away a forage source from bees right now. Bees are also accepted. This is not the, where they're um, trying to obtain a food source. So when you spray and control that, you're not taking that that food source away. Um, the other thing about it is, if you do a lowest rate of two four D, you're not going to take off the clovers. Uh, which I know some we get worried talking about um, the clover flower, you know, using that as a forage source. But they're also, like I said, there's other resources for them, mainly from blooming trees. The good thing about this is the other thing is we try to talk to you about spraying when they're not active. We can control a lot of these buttercups. Uh, you know, like this year at Christmas time, we had about four or five days of 70 degree weather. And obviously the beehives are kind of locked down at that time that's a great time to go ahead and control a lot of those weeds during that time of the year. So don't worry about that. We have bees. We have bees on the other side of the field over there and bees rot. They hate buttercups. Hmm. Well, nothing like he's buttercups. he's saying that they've got bees right over the hillside and and they don't like the buttercups. So don't worry about controlling the buttercup. Yeah, that seen. will be. Oh, yeah. Then now the the narcissus, the bulbs. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, those are also called buttercups, but it's a different kind of buttercup. This is a, a weed. Okay. You get a lot of the purple flowers. Oh, uh, the henbit. Yeah, henbit's really common right now. It's, we've got some up there, and they probably chewed it down around here. All right. So well, animals will eat that. I don't know if it's a good source for them. You'd have to ask Matt, but I think they might nibble on it. Forty three acres. The property. His property backs up to River Bend Nurseries Tree Farm.
convince them to go elsewhere. I'm sorry for making any of y'all motion sick. A lot of times in this situation right here, this past fall, we were out here looking at some things. Anytime you're transitioning from woods into the light with the pasture, <laughs> hey, there's, there's a goat or two. Yeah. You see who the coyotes picked off. <laughs> We see a lot in this situation, a lot of perilla men, uh, which is something that we could do kind of a fall pasture walk, but this farm is kind of been loaded there. Once again, same situation. I, I'm seeing a lot of summer grasses, Bermuda grasses, some other grasses. Not a situation I would get, I would get any really return on fertilizing this at this time. So this is also their pasture. <laughs> yeah, I didn't read that way. Push, push them back. All right. Watch your bottom arm. No seeding here. There's been no reseeding done in this pasture. Seeding map was two years ago. I seeded this. He seeded this two years ago. No, so you, you can see it when you've got a really large stand of grass here, large stand of fescue. These bigger slumps, slumps tend to be the fescue. We've got some orchard grass that looks like playing around in here. You'll see that there are some buttercup out here. I just you can kind of look in here and see some of that. Uh, uh, it's hen, a hen bit. Uh, purple dead metal is very, very similar. The only way they really tell the difference is the leaves. Mm -hmm. So when I'm looking at this situation, I see some kind of golden grass right in here. That is uh, sage, broom sage. So once again, that can indicate a couple of different things to me. Um, it can indicate lower poor fertility. Um, and it's also competition grass. When there's plenty of competition, it doesn't want to be seen. Um, but if you get a really hot, dry fall or spring, or I mean fall or uh, summer, and your fescue and everything else kind of goes away, that's when it really starts to thrive. So it doesn't always mean that you have low soil fertility, but it can be an indicator of that. Um, but in this situation, I'm looking at, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of buttercup in here, but I've also got a tremendous amount of clover. You can kind of look at that. So if I said that this is my pasture, um, you can go one of two, you could fertilize it and you could get a return on that. But I'm also looking at, okay, if, if, my, if I'm looking at a bottom line and I am grazing this thing, I'm probably getting enough fertilizer from this abundant stand of clover to probably cover me this year. And if I'm trying to keep it in my pocket, this might be, but now if I had this situation and I didn't have this thick stand of clover, I might look at trying to put in, trying to put in maybe 30 pounds. Uh, where I would definitely see, and so he's, this pasture over here has just been received in the fall, correct? I want to go up there and look at that pasture because that's where um, I want to talk about that situation. But this this stand, he's got a great stand. When are we talking about putting them in here, Willis? We'll put it in orchard grass and clover, and I'll put it in two years ago. Okay. So, and so 
this doesn't look like it's been as overgrazed as some of these other areas because that's where he been keeps on, them. They've not been on this at all this year. We're holding it back. Okay. So they haven't been on it at all this year. So th this is a this will be a great opportunity. They'll get a lot of grazing value out of this. You've got a multitude of different grasses here, uh, but it, it's a uh, it's in good situation. So you're going to start to see a lot of growth because these grasses are not going to respond. Um, until we get a little bit more of our warmer temperatures in the soil. So any questions as we as we look right here? Let's go look up this one other area here real quick. Can yeah. we get out of here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody right there towards the gate. Now, why does it have all this other stuff in it? We are standing right there, kind of in front of the gate. That's obviously where the tractor comes in and out for cattle coming back and forth. He's talking about in high compaction areas, that's where we're seeing the buttercup in an otherwise healthy stand of clover and orchard grass and fescue. In areas of compaction, you will see some of those weeds creep back in. And he's talking about how they do herbicide control to keep the weeds down. Um, usually a lot of times you're spraying it when they're not on it. And it depends on the product. You just have to go by label rates. So we're talking about just with, and with animals, I'm not your expert for sure. But when you're putting out products, you're making sure you're going by what the label says. And a lot of them will have re-entry intervals and the times you can bring livestock back into a pasture after you've sprayed. Okay. The land and then did uh, some reseeding this past fall. And so this is this is what you talked about being if you had if you were said my number one thing is to be a grass grower and then a grazer of whatever second. So your number one goal was to be able to get the grass growing in an ideal situation. That is to plant it in the fall, give it a couple rainy seasons, basically a late fall, uh, early winter, and then an early winter. Or late winter, early spring, to get it going, really establish a root. So whenever something does start grazing it, they've got a lot of opportunities to graze it down a few inches, and they're not going to be pulling the root right out of the ground. So it's got a good set of roots here. This is a situation. If if I own this, where a hundred percent, especially if I own this situation, this would be a great for a hay crop. Um, and a hundred percent of the time. Say that <laughs> today, as, as fertilizer prices as high as they are, I would fertilize this every time, uh, and you're going to get your return on this because for hay prices you're going to you're going to get it because you're going to get that. It may not be you may be passing on down the line a little bit some of those costs, but the tonnage you're going to get out and the quality of hay you're going to get that every time. So. I don't know where fertilizer prices will go, but today I would do this each and every time for this type of situation. It was fertilized. Okay. This was fertilized. He was saying this has been fertilized. 
rice fertilizer like it was, but they did not fertilize that other one. So the field we just left, they didn't fertilize because of prices, but this one they did. Uh, yes. Do they typically uh, cut for hay and let them graze, or you're just doing uh, you, you can. If I had a, a crop like this, yeah. it would stay in hay production until it's. I would not utilize them as both. Okay. okay? Right. They don't work as well. Some people will. Maybe in that situation, they will do a first spring cut and then they will graze it right after. It think fields are really hard to serve two dual purposes. Uh, you're just not getting the same value out of, out of each one of them. Uh, so if you've got different types of grasses, you can sometimes try to get by with doing with it. If you have a good stand like this, you're better off to cut it for hay and maintain it for hay as probably as long as you can before then transitioning it over to, to something else when you start filling it in with clover or some other things along the way. Anybody have any questions about here? Any questions from Zoom? All right, well, um, this might be a good opportunity to come over here and talk for those that want to just kind of talk a little bit about the Scotties or, or just the cattle in general. We can certainly talk a little bit about that um, or any other pasture questions. For those that have some questions from, from Mr. Gillum about the sheep and the goats when they go back up to the barn, um, we can start to kind of break up and address those questions. So you can go right there. For those that want to go through a little more information about the, the sheep and goats, uh, Mr. Gillum will probably go back that way. What would y'all like? It's like a choose your own adventure. <laughs> She's never killed, they just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. They said they wanted cattle on Zoom, so okay. we're going with you. All right. So I, I will try to do the best just to so see how many what we got and how many we got here. Tara, we, we made it difficult. We made everybody take a choice. <laughs> we only have so much daylight left. <laughs> All right, so for those on Zoom, you're fine. This is our buttercup that we're talking about, not the daffodils that you see. This guy right there. Um, so there's hen bit and then there's dead nettle. Um, that looks like hen bit to me. Um, that's a very prominent weed this time of year. Um, that is a dead nettle. <laughs> I think they also have different leaves. Like here's the hen bit, but that other one might be the dead nettle. So you see how close similar they look, those flowers? Yeah. I believe these are actually there's one of them. Um, so one that looks not like the others <laughs> is not. Yeah. He is uh, across the obviously of a Hereford and a Scottish Highlander. Uh, he is he's a calf and make somebody he, he's a steer, but really they're still pretty high in value uh, for that. 
there is I don't, I'm, a, I'm not obviously an expert in the shadow economy, but I must rapidly become one because it, the popularity is going so fast. So uh, I want to help have you guys kind of help me direct me where you want to go on, on the cattle side because we can go in a lot of different areas. One of them, obviously, this for this past year last year was another hip field. Uh, hip. Oh, hemp. This used to be a hemp field. <laughs> the legal kind. So, uh, so it, it, uh, you know, there's a lot of nutrients that went into the hip, so it, it put a lot of nutrients in here. So when we're looking at this pasture, they used to have, uh, just feed out some steers here. And they had a pretty good. You know, they had probably two pounds of game per day on a high quality forage right here. And so that's where we, we start to get in some things when we get into uh, grazing during the summer, especially grazing cattle during the summer on this type of product. Uh, we get into endophyte toxicosis. And so on every, pretty much every farm that has tall fescue, and I think if we start talking about endophyte toxicosis, it can impact Horses, cattle, where we see on cattle is more on the pocketbook side. And so on the cattle side, we start to get into a restriction of the blood flow to the animal. And so during the summer, they can't cool themselves very well. Mm -hmm. uh, the further north you get, they get what we call a uh, fescue foot. And basically during the winter, where they're getting such reduced flow of blood capillaries to the foot, their foot almost freezes off. Uh, we don't see that here. We see the, the restriction in, in the braces of body temperature. And so you'll start, if you go out in your herd, you've got cattle, or if you get cattle and you see one that has a really shaggy hair coat in the summer, that's some of the effects of endophyte. In, so endophyte comes from tall fescue. So this, this stuff right here. So what, it's really hard to, to get all this down in a very short period of time, but this grass right here, got thicker blade. This is our best cool season grass that we have, the best. Um, it's the only one that will actually kind of survive our summers. Uh, a lot of the others, they it just get too hot and they melt. The funny thing is, is what causes this stuff to survive is the endophyte that is in this. When you take that endophyte, it's a fungus, when you take that out, and they have, it dies very, very rapidly. We just cannot handle the summer. So we have to have this grass. This is the basis for almost every one of our operations out here. The time when it's at its highest is when it's down here, very, very close to ground, about the lowest two inches, and when it's putting on the seed heads. In between, it's a lot lower, but it's at its highest when it's all the way down there and at the top of the seed head. So if you're trying to reduce that, especially that's when you start to see in late May, when you start to see that is remove seed heads and don't let them graze it all the way to the ground. That's gonna reduce that. So what happens, you'll start to see um, them grazing. They obviously have to, or in summer, especially we see the effects is where they start to get that restricted blood flow. So you start to see them spending more time in the shade. You start to see them spend more time in ponds if you've got a pond, um, but you see the pound of gain per day go from 1.75 pounds a day to sometimes one or less. You're losing as much as close to it, a pound of gain per day during the summer. And so what can you do? So you can try to replace all this grass you have, and they have some varieties that they have actually gone to New Zealand and found varieties of fescue that had good endophyte, kept it alive, but also uh, did not cause any of the bad issues. And so, they, they have what we call novel endophyte. 
The problem is you have to wipe out this entire pasture. You have to spend kind of a whole season wiping this out. And then you have to make sure that you don't bring in hay, that you don't take a mower from a pasture that doesn't have it and bring it in here because eventually it doesn't take much to reestablish the other and you lose all that talk that, that effects that you had of that expensive reestablishment of fescue. Um, it's about four times as high as far as seed, or it was, and now it's you know, kind of creeping closer together um, to reestablish this other seed. So you look at what we have out here is what's another way to try to mitigate that, and that's with clovers. That dilutes out some of the effects that we get from trying to do with tall fescue. And so you see there's a bunch of clover here, there's a bunch of clover over out there. That really helps dilute out that effect. But we have to go with the basis is that on every one of our farms that we utilize um, tall fescue as the basis for our forage is that we have the effects of endophyte going on. So things to remember, if you can dilute it, that could, with um, warm season grasses, or you can dilute, dilute it with clover, that really helps reduce some of that, that cost that you're losing. Um, and then look at your, your control. So keep them from overgrazing it down to really short levels and keep it from going to seed because that's where that, uh, that concentrated most of that uh, in the fight fat. So that helps in that situation. I know that it's not good for pregnant horses. Like uh, no, it does not have that effect on for cattle. It is purely a blood flow restriction. So it restricts all their, their capillaries and so they do not get that blood flow, which doesn't allow them to cool off during the summertime. And so it really hammers down on their gain. You would see that some of the same things with horses, but we don't measure gain as much. Is there an alternative for fescue, like maybe uh, rye or ryegrass? Um, ryegrass is a can be an alternative. It's typically for us, it's more operates like an annual grass. You've got to plant it every year. So uh, what you see with ryegrass in this situation, you would plant it probably in late fall. It gets started a little bit, then it kind of goes stagnant for the first part of winter. And then early spring where the fescue is still kind of holding back a little bit, the ryegrass is really going to shoot up pretty quickly uh, during the early spring. And then by late spring, it's starting to peter off and you get to end of May, early June, it's completely done and gone. So for the most part, you have to reestablish it each and every year. It's a high quality grass. In a lot of situations, it works to do kind of an annual planting of, of ryegrass, especially if you've got uh, warm season grasses that you can, that don't come on until late May, early June, you can plant in some of that ryegrass. Uh, if you get some winter feeding areas, if, if you do it early enough in spring, you're kind of rolling the dice a little bit because you never know when you get a late frost or a late, late, late freeze. So you have this area right here, maybe in late February, you could roll the dice and try to put some of those um, uh, spring oats or a, a ryegrass in there. The biggest thing that you have to worry about is you plant it and when it's 65, 70 degrees, and then a week later when it's just starting, or two weeks later, it's just starting to pop up and you get a heavy freeze or a heavy freeze, it'll just wipe it out before it really sets its hardiness. So that's where you're kind of rolling the dice by doing it in spring, uh, but the ryegrass can be a good one. As far as the perennial, which is, it grows year after year in the same clump, uh, tall fescue is really the only thing we have. Yeah, I think that sort of a perennial ryegrass. Yeah, <laughs> they just, it doesn't have the heat standing capability. Yeah. You mentioned a perennial rye, and perennial rye just doesn't stand up to our heat. There's for short season. It's, it just doesn't have a lot of it. It will not last. That's yeah. really what we're looking for a lot of those things. There's a lot of grasses that work really well in a very and annual grasses are great grasses. When you look at crabgrass or sorghum Sudan or something like that, they have a lot of great nutritional value. The downside is, is you have to replant all these things every year. But there's a lot of people that fully believe in the annual rotation. You know, they start with a winter rye or something like, or a winter rye late fall. I take them up till mid to late May, 
And then they come in with a crabgrass um, sorghum sedan, run that through, terminate that uh, in mid fall, and then re restart that. You know, it's just it's a labor intensive, um, and sometimes it can be a little bit more expensive. But the quality of grass that you get out of it is pretty high. Are you doing a lot more fertilizing with that? Uh, anytime you're doing first seeding, uh, most of the time I'll, re I'll, I'll fertilize. The only time I would be hesitant, so if I, if I let this grass play out um, another year or two and it's starting to be thin out in places, and then I go, okay, I'm going to do some reseeding this, uh, this fall, I would not follow with a fertilizer until that grass, those new seedlings have been pretty well established and growing. Because if I've immediately applied a fertilizer at seeding, that's going to fertilize all that other stuff that really take off and it's going to overwhelm those new seedlings. And so I'll, I'll really kind of lose that, all that effort I put into it. So I would hold off probably till spring to do any type of fertilizing in that situation if I look at that. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, if you've got crab grasses, if you guys have been around enough uh, summer grasses, you know, they play a pretty thick, heavy mat. And so anytime you've got a thick, heavy mat of grasses, you really can't oversee, you can't drill that in to a thick, heavy mat of grasses. You're going to have to terminate by spring. And that's really the only way. The In the spring, for the most part, these grasses are going to be dying off. You don't really have to um, terminate them too much. You may have to do some spring to terminate and kill them, uh, but definitely during the, uh, the fall because those grasses don't really die until we get that first heavy frost in mid-October. Most of the time we would like to be uh, planting before that date. And so if you tried to plant them and it's September, October, and we still have some warm days, that crabgrass is still going to be competing and it's going to have to eat most of those seedlings. So for the most part, we have to come in and spray and kill that stuff before we start to plant. So, uh, you know, here's another situation, like obviously you guys have, you see where they're feeding hay, or that's where we're going to get, uh, I always try to recommend feeding that in a concrete area. We talked about those feed, pad, those feed pads that, that you can establish. See where we feed this hay, you're going to get a, a heavy nutrient load right there. You really can't see anything in, in kind of that decaying hay. You really need to kind of get that out of there, but that's where we're going to get a heavy dose of weed, probably pigweed, Palmer pigweed, spiny amaranth, which you can, if you grab it, it's pretty spiny and prickly, you'll know it. Um, almost guaranteed that's where we'll find a bunch of that to pop up. And so that's where sometimes you can come back in and put a, if they're still feeding hay there for a while, you don't want to put a spring cool season grass in there. You might pop back in if you've got a bigger area pop in and put some uh, uh, crabgrass crabgrass is great grass um, so if you ever try to utilize it it's a, it's a great grass to utilize but that's a good situation to come through and try to plant some there um, as far as anybody have any questions as far as uh, the cattle or the pasture uh, <laughs> Are there any good ways to extend your grazing season? Uh, yes, it, part of it depends on how much um, land you have. Um, so a couple of different things. If you don't have any more land, um, you can diversify some of your plantings. And so if you, if you have the ability to put in some warmer season grasses, that what that does is that allows you to pull the grass, pull them off of your cool season grasses when they're stressed the most. And so you're getting a little bit less return on them. And the more that you try to overgraze these cool season grasses during their stress point, which would be during the winter and the summer, you can pull them off during that time. That keeps them from going down as fast. So if you had a warm season Bermuda or some other warm season grasses that you can put them on that recover pretty frequently and don't need near as much water. You can put a lot more pound per acre on summer grasses than you can a cool season grass during the summer. So if you get, it doesn't take much because they can handle it. Um, that allows your, your cool season grasses to be able to really get a good shot during spring and, and that fall. 
And so you'll get more, more value by doing that. So um, you can look at doing that. You can look at doing some stockpiling. That, that, that means you have to have at least some acreage that you can pull your cattle off of and not have them have access to it. So the way that that typically would work is you'd be looking at, um, let's say this is the field that we want to stockpile. We can put them on the rest of it about late, late August, early September, mid-September in there. We pull them off of here. If we have a good stand of grass that has some potential, we come in there and put a, a 30, 45 pounds of nitrogen on that. You, could, you might have to do, depending on what type of season we have, we get some cooler weather with a little bit of water. You might have to at least knock some seed heads down. As doubtful you will, uh, but we should get a pretty good green up growth. And so maybe early November, mid-November, we pull them out of here, and so we can probably get um, maybe a month of grazing off of that. So you've really knocked up one month of hay feeding off of it. And so uh, that's a really great way. It's not everybody has the ability to, to sacrifice part of the pasture and not utilize that. Uh, but stockpiling is a, that's a great value to knock off one month of hay. Uh, so it just really depends right now whether you where do you extend it out? Another thing is, is looking at during the summer, do you get more value in continuing to graze pasture that is in, you know, quote, free versus if, if we get like a hot, dry summer is to pull them off of that when it is really, really hot and dry and feed them hay. And so obviously you have a cost for hay and so you, you directly see that when you have to go out and buy hay or feed hay out of your barn that you put a $60 of bale value on that. And so when you do that, but you also have to look at what's the cost of overgrazing that and losing that pasture for, for frequent for future years. So uh, I see a lot of times you, you see some people that some of the people that are more in tune with what their economics and their operation are they'll be the first ones feeding hay when it gets really dry because I know it's, it's sometimes cheaper to feed that hay than it is to renovate that entire pasture because they're going to lose that through the fall, probably through the next spring. And then there's a cost to actually put that all back in the ground too. Any other questions? Anything regarding the, the beef cattle? I don't know how to, I'm sure everybody's coming from all different areas and I don't, don't know how to answer everybody's question regarding all these all these topics, but. Are the island cattle taken care of any differently than a typical beef cattle? No, outside of the, the horn, just working with them. Mm -hmm. No, no you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna feed them uh, and manage them just the same. Any issues with the meat? These, there, there's some other breeds. These have been around here a little bit longer. So I think we've bred a little bit of a tolerance into some of these breeds. Um, I will note, say that there is a, in the very front of this property, there's a pond. And that was one of the first things I recommend, we, we talked about and recommended was fencing them off because they do spend a lot of time in that pond. So they're not going to be near um, the tolerant as other breeds of cattle. Um, but the Scottish Highlanders have tended to be a little bit more tolerant than some of our other heritage breeds that have been brought over. I've worked with a lot of people that have had different heritage breeds, and they do not do, do near as well as the Scottish Highlanders. And I, a lot of that's just because we've had them around here a little bit longer. So the ones that didn't do well didn't last, and the ones that have maintained them uh, adapted somewhat to it. But they, they will try to, they will slow down a lot during the summer. They will spend a lot of time in the pond if you have it, so, uh, which is not good. I think I've seen some of the mineral blends. They, they put an ingredient in there. I don't know what they're putting in. He asked about mineral blends for helping with heat tolerance. Yeah, and we are not sure. I had a question about the mineral. Is there any advantage to using the bag mineral over the blocks? Bag versus block mineral. Um, yeah, they'll typically consume more of the, of the bag mineral. Uh, obviously, now's a good time. If, if you've got cattle 
uh, which you can see, especially if you've got a spring calving herd, um, they're calving right now. Uh, magnesium is really important right now to be feeding a high magnesium mineral. And so there, there's been two kind of trains of thought regarding high magnesium mineral is that it used to be that we would only feed high magnesium um, at the time of calving in the spring. because We're getting a uh, big push for, uh, for uh, green up. And so what we see is for cattle is we get, the, there's a big need because they're trying to milk. There's a big call for magnesium. And so we get all grass tetany uh, that, that comes from uh, being low, low magnesium because we get some sulfur in here that kind of binds up that magnesium if not as available. So we tend to, if we have some heavy milkers during the springtime, push for high magnesium so that make sure they get enough magnesium to keep them up and going. Where the, the, the train of thought is probably now is trying to maintain them on a good quality amount of magnesium throughout a good balanced min mineral all throughout the year. And then not having to do that high mag at the, just at that one point in time is that they tend to do better when they're on a good balanced mineral all throughout versus trying to just push them at one point in time. Um, typically they're going to consume I know a lot of people don't like the, the bag mineral because when they first put it out there, they say, my cattle just ate way too much. They, they just they sucked it up. And typically what that is, is cattle will only eat what, for the most part, what they need. And when they put it out there, that's because they were probably deficient. And so that, and so that first couple of times you're putting that bag mineral out there, they may be consuming a lot more than traditionally, but that would, that typically that, that will balance out and they'll, meet their needs and kind of go from there. After that, uh, you know, they, they should be consuming whatever their, their needs are. But typically we get more of a balance and they're, they're taking in what they need through the bag than from the salt block. Funny yeah. enough, there's actually a block inside of the right of that in the least mineral. Yeah. So it's just trying to protect it. I don't seem to see a lot of the protein crowds around here. Is that something that um, Who works for a feed company? <laughs> <laughs> Who's not going to tell me now? No. Product protein tubs have a time and place everywhere. Every product you see in a in a feed company has a time and place, and so it's just knowing when and where is that time and place for that product. And so the the protein tubs sometimes are are, are the the easy button, and. Sometimes in our operations, we need the easy button because not many of us are trying to be farmers full time and that be our only income. And so you can't always be attentive and get the product out there when you need it. And so sometimes you need to be able to hit that easy button and set it because you got some other things going on. Protein tubs, um, I think we talked about this. I don't know, I guess many classes going on right now. I can't always <laughs> remember uh, what I talked about. Uh, but we talk about the lip. The first limiting factor when feeding any animal, uh, what's the first ingredient you try to you try to sell somebody on? You try to get sold on protein. protein, right? That's the first ingredient everybody tries to say. Look at the bag, look at protein, look at whatever it is. Well, the first limiting ingredient that limits all other functions is energy. So, if you put all these cattle out here. Um, the first thing that's going to stop them to shut down that their body has to have is they have to have energy to be able to walk, to breathe, to you know, have a calf, to stay warm is energy. So it comes from anything, but it comes from grain. Um, it's carbohydrate. So nitrogen, I'm not trying to get too much into chemistry, nitrogen for, or protein is pretty much energy with a little N for the protein. So if that animal is deficient, if all you give them is a protein shake, they're gonna turn around and basically what they do is they consume it, pee out the nitrogen and turn that into energy. So they've just, they've taken a product that was twice as expensive, three times, four times as expensive in the, in the protein, peed out that, the expensive stuff and turned that into basically uh, like corn. So if you just, if you continue to overfeed them protein, they're going to 
and, and underfeed energy, they're going to balance that out themselves. So when you get in the protein tubs, that is a time and place. And so if you don't have a high quality forage, because what you're doing with the protein tubs, that's not something the cow's actually using themselves. That's what the microbes inside their, their gut, their stomach, are using. So those you're feeding those microbes to turn around, convert that into a nitrogen source that, that that cow can use. And then that cow is actually kind of consuming those bugs. So you're feeding those bugs. Well, those bugs, in order to be able to do that, they have to have a good quality uh, source of, of forage to be able to convert that over into something they can do. So they definitely have a time and place. If you're, if you're deficient in some nitrogen sources, that can be it. But overall, cows, horses, anything, will spend, have a longer period of time that they are deficient in energy than they do protein. A good quality for cows, a good, really good quality hay or pasture can meet a cow's nutrient needs 10 to, 10 to 11 months, 12 months out of the year. So you would only need to supplement. Some of them don't even need anything. If you've got a good quality uh, pasture hay that's got probably 10 to 12, probably 12, 14% crude protein in it, uh, that takes care of all their needs. So you, you may not need to. Different stages of life, you've got a heifer that's trying to breed. She maybe got a first, she's got a second calf heifer. So she's got a calf on the ground. She's tied to milk. She's trying to grow. You know, you probably can't get enough resources out of your hay. But you got a five-year-old cow, and you know she's she's pretty good. She's done growing. You can probably get a good quality hay to give you most of the nutrients you need. You may need some right there, those last few, those last couple weeks of her last trimester uh, before she calves, and then maybe those that definitely probably that month to two months after calving depending on what time of year it is where she's got that heaviest uh, load from trying to milk you probably need a supplemental source but outside of that energy is the number one protein you may only be deficient that first month right after she's calved and she's trying to milk so uh, just time and place for every everything that you see out there uh, there's a time and place for each one of them. Uh, it's just making sure that it fits what you need. So for the most part, uh, protein tubs, you, you need to be aware of what you're doing. There's a lot of things about being a miracle. No, there's, nothing, there's no miracle one shot. You put it out there and they don't need to eat grass. They, don't, they, can, take, you know, they can eat gravel and it turns it into this good quality product. So uh, some, of the, some of the marketing will get it to you, but there's... There, there's a time and place for every one of them. Are these cows necessarily high maintenance compared to whatever back is or whatever? No, I mean I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that any of them are high maintenance. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I've not ever <laughs> experienced a lot of, of growing with them. Um, anytime you select. Any, it's like really anytime you select for a certain trait um, here it might just be the ability to stand our feet is that you 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 sacrifice somewhere else and so anytime you select for height you know obviously there's there's lots of different heights with them um, or the ability to stand in the heat you sometimes sacrifice things so anytime i start to see some of the kind of the novelty things that are, are adapted to here that work born here or made to live here i always kind of worry about what did what did we sacrifice did we sacrifice breeding ability sometimes we start, we, we do that on some of these um not necessarily saying these but some of these things like that are kind of novelty um ability to breed back is sacrifice so I, i'm always kind of worried about that um some of the other some of them are more commercial type cattle who maybe didn't see as much specific trait selection you, you know you might it might be geared towards that where they might be a little bit better uh, producing meat quality or mothering abilities 
but we didn't necessarily select for one trait. All right, do we wait long enough to get started to get cold? Any questions from Zoom? We can uh, we can start walking back. I can answer any questions we have along the way, but <coughs> please don't hesitate. I mean, it's it's kind of hard to cover everything there is to cover about all these things, but um, we do have other classes that get into more specific aspects of each one of these. But uh, I'm happy to address any questions you guys have along the way here. So for a smaller farm, can a specialty breed like this and cost per pound kind of offset the the bulk? what the market is if you try to sell it to meat wise you know, right now most people that are selling this so I, I was at a beef producer that produces island last week and he told me that he was selling his steers for produce for six dollars a pound now, yeah. what's he trying to sell you cows <laughs> um, I had already bought it. Okay. Let's <laughs> take the hide off a lot of them, especially on hamburger. You know, it starts out as uh, meat, and we just add fat back in. So uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know of anybody right now that is specifically selling Scottish Highlander meat per se, there's, there's more and more people obviously selling the breeding stock, but when you start to break down per pound, but if you look at, um, if you're wanting a small cow, smaller cow calf operation and, and acreage wise, there may be some, some relevance to having some of those. We'll find out because we've got a lot more people are getting into it. <laughs> Do you know what he does with these cows? Like these are deep right now, these they're not the So he's not raising them for himself to eat. No, th th there's there's they have not done anything with these. Um I think they pulled one off and um one is being sold to a photographer that wants to use them for photographs. So <laughs> I just got three different things right on it. <laughs> oh, well, if y'all don't have any questions on Zoom, I think we're going to wrap up soon. Um, any questions that, that didn't get answered that y'all wanted to know? Got a beautiful sunset here. <laughs> All right. Well, thank y'all for joining us. Um, we hope to see you next week. We only have a couple more classes. So um, if you have any questions from today that didn't get answered, just let us know. Um, yes, I was. we were happy that the cell signal worked so that we could get this to y'all who couldn't be here. Um, but be looking for the recap email and we will see y'all next week. Have a good night.